What's going on? It's Matt. We are ending the week with another restaurant expert roundup interview. This time we got a, another offer. We're going to talk about breaking some bad news, whether it's to your customers, whether maybe it's to your spouse, but more importantly, handling it correctly. We'll be back in a second. Jeff, I know you got some chainsaws in the background. The ironic part is you're not in the middle of a hurricane. You're in Texas having chainsawing. Yeah, howdy, Matt. We're in Austin, Texas here. Just recovering, honestly, from a very long, hot summer. Yep. Some of the trees outside of our building didn't make it. And so just so happens the crew show up today right when we're interviewing one another. And uh, I think their their work will be done quick enough. That's how it always works out. I'll never forget years ago, I was actually at, I got the growler here, Hofbrauhaus House, Pittsburgh. I was in their beer garden and we had set up and we were going to do this live broadcast for a promotion. And we had it all scheduled out and we didn't think about the landscapers. And these guys showed up of all the times to mow the grass. And there's only like this 50 by 10 foot patch of grass next to them between the beer garden and the river. And so they had to mow it then. And so we actually would kept trying to move and pause and they would stop and take a smoke break. And I'm like, come on guys. It's just luck of the draw, isn't it? That's Murphy's law right at work. Oh, yeah. Whenever it happens. So I guess tell us, tell the studio audience out there, I guess studios, internet audience who you are. I got the book here. They need to have it, but tell us about, about the book, about yourself, about your company. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm a 30 plus year PR guy and I grew up in the profession, really in the corporate communications landscape. I spent my first 15 years in the semiconductor business. Motorola was the company that I worked for. It became Freescale Semiconductor. And today it's something different. It got bought by NXP. And so in those 15 years, I really uh, f created the foundation for breaking bad news because I was involved in the company's crisis communication team. Okay. Or crisis management team, I should okay. say. And as bone jarring as that was, as a young practitioner, boy, was it a fantastic way to learn all the things that I wanted to know about the craft of public relations, communications, of stakeholders, etc. And then I've spent the last 17 years as an agency owner. And as an agency owner now, we specialize in two specific areas, food, which is why you and I are together, and energy. Okay. Both in food and energy, a crisis communication continues to be a really valuable craft to understand and know. And so it's continued to carry work through the years for me. Well, it's hard to grow a, a firm or an agency on that singular discipline um, when our clients who are here for promotion or for digital campaigns or even for our data science team, uh, when they know that there is a crisis component to our work, yep. they're happy about that. And they, I tell them when I introduce myself, this is the only reason you're ever going to see me around your work. Uh, it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> and, then, and then hand them off to one of our other team members. Uh, so that is a very short orientation to who we are. Our agency is a marketing and communications firm. We have 49 folks. We have a data science team, a fantastic strategy and creative team, and then, of course, wonderful account service folks. And um, food and energy, those are the two big spaces. Yep. We just hired our 54th person this past Monday. She started in the account management side of things. So I know we're on a similar path. Yeah, well done. I mean, growing an agency, especially past that you know, 20-person mark, really requires you to move from uh, entrepreneur to business manager in such an interesting way. And it took me a few years to get it that um, there's things that I had to stop doing and things that I wasn't allowed to do anymore. And um, it's a really fascinating growing process that uh, I wouldn't trade for anything. I love being a business owner and I still get to exercise some entrepreneurial skills every once in a while. Yeah, and there's some days I wonder what business I'm in because we're, this past couple of days has been the travel business. I've got seven employees going to Miami from Minnesota, Cincinnati, 
and where's the North and uh, Idaho, but they're trying to make it to Miami because they went there last night and one of them I had to reroute three different times because oh, he kept his flights were going to Phoenix or Salt Lake or Atlanta. Well, they weren't flying. They were going to fly right through the damn hurricane. So they're canceling. And it was kind of, it's kind of funny. I was telling a friend of mine, he's like, man, it's, it's really cool what you do. I'm like, yeah, I, I enjoy 90% of it. I said, but there's some days where I end up being something that I, I'm a travel agent or I'm, <laughs> I'm a, my crisis management was getting airfares and getting people booked. And last, you know, this morning at 520 talking to Austin, one of my camera crew, who got back from Roanoke, Virginia last night at 3.30 in the morning and got dropped off at the airport to go to Miami to meet the crew. And I'm like, I'm catching up with him at 5 in the morning. I go, hey, you're not sleeping at the gate, are you? <laughs> wow. Hey, good for you for taking care of your folks. And I guess we ought to take a moment just to send our best thoughts and vibes yeah. to all those folks in Fort Myers, all the way through Florida and now on the Atlantic coast. Boy, what a very tough situation that is and it it's not going to be better for years no it's and from what i've heard it's pretty i mean it's pretty bad we've got one employee that lives there my brother lives there and uh, we've got I, I think probably got between five to ten restaurants that we we work with there and you know i know a lot of them are just getting pummeled yeah it's a a tough environment and you know they'll 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 build back stronger than ever in a couple of years yeah you're right chip told us one of our employees said it's it's a mess down there it's armageddon he said like the eye hung over top of the the city for like four hours or something like that yeah really, just really churn dynamic. yeah really churn well um it reminds me in the in breaking bad news i talk about the story of a growing up on a farm in northeast iowa and one sunday afternoon you see really ugly looking clouds outside go down in this, in the cellar, sit there for 15 minutes and you're not farmers anymore when you come up. Yep. And that was my experience in some respects. I think that might've been the start of my crisis communications <laughs> career because <laughs> you have to tell yourself a new story about who you are yep. and imagine, uh, how you can shift, not only survive, but then shift into becoming something uh, that you didn't expect. And yeah. so it does, it's not just a couple of years of picking up debris and rebuilding. You almost have to reimagine your entire life um, if that was going to be your life. Yep. I agree. So let's talk about the book. I, it's ironic. I, I just realized, because when I was looking at your book, this brand here, Hofbrauhaus Pittsburgh, we dealt with for five or six years. It's a brand out of Munich, Germany. They've got I don't know, eight or nine locations in the States here. One of the franchisees I know owns three of them. And they had a few crises in their day. And I was involved in one of them. And it was it was tough to kind of analyze the, the, what you could or couldn't do. Like they had one where there was a person, a patron had left their restaurant and uh, left there and did some unresponsible things driving wise and ended up causing a car wreck, which caused a death. And you know, they were in the unfortunate situation. They couldn't say a word. I mean, literally for three years while this thing drugged them through the mud on the news and they were 100% in the clear and there was enough proof that they were in the clear, but the insurance company doesn't care about that. The insurance company wants to make sure the settlement's a certain amount. And so they couldn't say anything. So it was no comment. But then there was another time where it was just a, a regular social media problem where some customer, I'll never forget it. This lady came on Facebook and said, my my brother who's in the Marines went to your restaurant and you wouldn't let him in because he's a Marine, which was crazy because the general manager of the location is a former Marine. <laughs> and so I'm like, what? And so I'm going through video surveillance footage. We're trying to track this down. We end up finding that as complete BS. And it had kind of already blown over. We got out, did some stuff on the front end of it, acknowledged this was out there because it had gotten some, some viral traction. Smart. Acknowledged it was there. Uh, let them know we we're investigating it. And then we got to a point where we had absolute proof it was BS, but it had already died down. And I'll never forget the owner said something that was real important that, that kind of stuck with me. His name was Jay. He said, Matt, if you step in dog crap, it smells. And he's like, it's, we already got covered our bases. People came to our support. It's obvious this was BS. Yes, we do have video surveillance that this did not happen because we had it lock, stock, and barrel. He's like, but – is there any good to bringing that up? It's already kind of went over the hump and went on its way. People quit talking about it. He's like, he has my, my dad used to always tell me if you step in crap, it smells bad again. He's like, so let's just let it sit. So talk about the book and, and acknowledging things on the front end. I know in chapter on page 45, there's this rapid response matrix. 
that you've developed in here, which was really cool. Talk about, you know, when you have a crisis and getting out in front of it and then kind of going on with it. Yeah, I do agree. And that scenario that you just talked about is a really good example of establishing the official narrative as quickly as possible. It's impossible to get out in front. Yeah. If that were the case, then these things would never occur. Yeah. But um, what makes them worse when they do occur is silence. Yeah. So I'm a big advocate for brands, just like the example you showed of very quickly move into the space, establish your official voice. Talk about the fact that you're examining what the allegation is, that you're on top of this, yeah. that you're activated. We're looking into this right now. Come back then and uh, provide a narrative, a message that sets up the conversation in a brand protection term and then ride it the rest of the way. If you need to escalate in some respects, you can make those decisions. But oftentimes that first move to get the message, get it established, get it out is 80%, 85% of the cure from there, especially on social media, yeah. the communities tend to then moderate themselves out or wash out um, things that really are harmful or just patently untrue, yeah. especially for brands that they like. Yeah. And that's, that's what happened here. And it was interesting I can't remember exactly how we did it. Cause it was, it was back in like 2015, 16 timeline. But I remember I, the message I stated, cause I'm like, what better situation do we have? The GM is a Marine. I'm pretty confident. He's not going to have rules at the front door. Hey, don't let my brothers in. Yeah. But we had a release that went out on all the social media and said, Hey, we we've seen the accusations we're, we're, we take this very serious. You know, we're a strong supporter of our, our, our men and women in, in uniform and our LEOs. And in fact, you know, I myself am a Marine. I'm the general manager of the restaurant. Uh, I can, I don't have any proof to say what did or didn't happen at this point, but we're taking care of it. And what happened was customers common sense took over uh, and, yeah. and, and then they can kind of start seeing through it. And then the, it's kind of like the political arguments on Facebook, they all kind of took their place and ours won out. And that's why we never reopened it. It's kind of like, you know, this, I don't know if you're a football fan or not, but you know, the Bengals game last night, the quarterback got, hit and knocked out and went to the hospital and they were talking about how the team on Sunday was like, Hey, uh, his back was hurt. And it was like, no, he had a pretty serious concussion on Sunday. It was pretty obvious to tell that when he fell on the field, but it's like, you know, didn't pass the stuff test. And I think a lot of consumers saw this and were like, okay, they're not going to turn them down because of that. And that was one of the reasons that when it did die down, we didn't bring it back up again and ignite a whole new thing. Like Nick, like Jay said, don't step in, step in crap a second time. Yeah, right on. I mean, I think you, that the way that you describe it, it played out just as you would expect. And that's a really important word. I talk about it a lot in Breaking Bad News because it is expectations that set the framework of the narrative into play. When you're in a, the soup, so to speak, yep. sometimes I say when the spaghetti hits the fan, um, it is taking a moment just to understand and ask yourself, what does a reasonable person, what does a reasonable person expect? Yep. And if you can articulate that, then you can create a message and move it into play. It's amazing how quickly those brush fires die out yep. once you move into that mental space. And a lot of times when they, if you don't move in it quick enough, it doesn't die. Out. I don't know if you've seen the documentary that's on Netflix now about Manti Teo, the former oh, team player. I couldn't stop watching it. It I was mean, just tragedy. I, I remember when it happened. And of course, you see these things now and you see the behind the scenes. I remember what happened and I yeah. can't believe the narrative that's fed to you. And when you see that they had a chance to be a week ahead of where they were, and then had they come out and said, hey, we've heard about this. We've seen it. We're investigating it. Here's what we think happened. Ninety percent of what happened wouldn't have happened. No question about it. In my mind, that was uh, – it's very hard to watch that documentary. Uh, I found myself just wanting to tear my shirt off practically because yeah. you feel so bad for Manti Teo. He's a victim in this. Oh, yeah, and big time. If you um, think about the matrix that you talked about earlier, establishing that as the first premise, he's the victim, um, gives you the narrative high ground. Yep. And that didn't happen. No. So he just got unmercifully attacked. Yeah. 
and he never survived it. I mean, you, with what he was from an, an athlete, like, you know, my company, we've got 15 people in the sales world. And sometimes a salesperson will go 20 of 30 and then something will happen. They'll go one for 50 and it's mental. It, yeah. it, you got to figure out how to get out of it. Well, he's a very high caliber, you know, highest a, you know level athlete that exists in the world. And that buried him. He mentally never got back to himself. And so that stupid hoax and then the, you know, the inability for Notre Dame to actually handle it correctly is what took him down a path where he, I mean, his NFL career, no doubt, no doubt was 90% less than what it could have been. Oh, no question about it. And he seems like, especially in that documentary, he comes off as a, as a really decent human being yeah. who just, he had something really bad played on him. And yeah. uh, the timing question that brought this into the conversation is real yeah. moving quickly establishing the narrative that sets up the, the, that narrative arc, uh, boy, it's so critical. And you know, what I talk about in the book is if you can do that in two hours, you're working inside of a best in class framework. Okay. But boy, that is a, that tick tock box, um, is very high pressure making decisions inside of it is really tough, yeah. uh, but that's what the best brands do. Yep. So this next one, as I said before we got on here, hit me right uh, right between the eyes because one of the few classes I remember from college that I studied that I did my job in that class was Dr. Jay Flippin, and he would always talk about, you know, Marshall McLuhan, and he would say, the medium is in the massage. You know, <laughs> the medium is the message. And sure enough, chapter 10, it's in here. And I'm like, hey, that's the first time I've seen that guy's name in 20-something years. So. <laughs> Talk about this chapter and as it relates to public relations and, and making sure you contain the fires and put them out. Yeah. What I'm really thinking about in Breaking Bad News is that, and this is the difference between the way I view crisis communication and the way a lot of other very good practitioners do. I view it as a system. Okay. So the system is at its real core made up of three M's, message, messenger, and method of delivery. Okay. This is where you're referring to as the medium is the message. Yep. Um, in this system, my overriding thesis is you don't have to know the right answer. What you do need to know is what your options are. So I detail 16 message options, okay. nine messenger options, and then 12 of the method options that make up the chapter about medium being the message. And what I'm talking to talking about there is that um, we often hear it, brands in trouble resort to no comment. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll litigate this in the court of law. Well, you just lost the court of public opinion. Yep. So what good does that do you? By the way, the court of law is going to grind out for two or three years. Um, so that's one extreme. The other extreme that you often hear is we need to get the CEO in front of a press conference to say they're sorry. That's probably the worst advice I think anyone could ever give an executive who's facing a brand crisis. Now, it may end up being... Uh, the preferred technique. But what I try to talk about in medium being the message is you've got 12 options. Let's work down through them um, and balance the control that you have of your message with the authenticity of your brand rather than knee jerking your way to, from no comment to let's put ourselves in front of a yeah. phalanx of hot microphones and reporters at a press conference. It was a terrible idea, really. Yeah. Uh, how many times do we practice that in our life and are good at it? And politicians have 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 tend to be the ones that do that the worst because they they, <laughs> they they are the most knee jerk. And I and I always crack up because I'm like, man, some of the people that I find do those things the worst are the ones that should have the best advice. But literally, they come out and it's this one day, and then it's this the next day, and then it's yeah. day, like, oh, you meant that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, we were mentioning football, and turns out football coaches are pretty darn good in that venue. 
Yeah. Because they've got to do it every Sunday morning, Saturday night, or Monday morning. And uh, they get really well practiced at it. But unless you are in that kind of press conference environment on a regular basis, uh, you're probably setting yourself up for failure. Can eat you alive. Yeah, absolutely. Eat you alive. So in methods, I kind of take this stair step mechanic saying, hey, there's a dozen different ways for you to convey your message. We can do written statements. We can do background briefings. We can use different kinds of adversarial interviews. There's even using other spokespeople, third parties to help you to give you a testimonial, right? Um, You can even use social media if that's the proper venue. Uh, But that's a brush fire all of its own, isn't it, with trolls? Most important for me is um, to convey, hey, look, you've got options. Don't just think of one or another. You've got a dozen. I love it. We're going to have to go deeper into this on, on another interview at another date. That This is the book, Breaking Bad News, 12 Essential Crisis Communication Tools by that man on the other side of the camera, Jeff Hahn out of Austin, Texas. I got it on Amazon. Is that the is it available on hanpublic.com or is Amazon the best place for them to find it? Um, it's also available on breakingbadnewsbook.com. There we go. That's my Break- author page. Okay, Breaking Bad News let me put that on here. www.breakingbadnewsbook.com. That's it. There it is. Breakingbadnewsbook.com. Perfect. Uh, and, if, and if you do find it somewhere, like I got my own Amazon, we'll go in there and we leave reviews. So if you, you can always support the authors by leaving reviews on the place you find them. But get the book, study up, learn how to properly break bad news. Because it's not if bad news is coming, if you're an entrepreneur. It's when. And it's how you handle it when it comes. Perfectly said, Matt. I've always uh, felt that same way. Um, And if we have a system that we can quickly roll out, practice, we're going to navigate even the most difficult situations. Yep. Well, I appreciate your time today, Jeff. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff.